basketball decisions supersede basketball plays. That's a simple phrasing that I've come up with recently that I think just, again, nails that for me and nails it for players to be able to understand that at the end of the day, we want decisions. Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Today, we're joined by the founder of Basketball Immersion, Chris Oliver. After coaching for over 23 years, he created Basketball Decision Training, BDT, to bridge the gap between skill development and game applications of those skills. Most recently, Coach Oliver was head coach at the University of Windsor, where he won over 300 games. He shares his games approach to coaching, practical evidence-based drills, and decision training concepts openly through in-person and online learning at basketballimmersion.com. Before we hear from Coach, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamoti Podcast. What's up, Coach? All good, Matt. How are you doing? Oh, Where are you? Man. Hi, I, I'm doing great. Just got out of basketball class here at, at Grapevine Faith, and so, you know, kind of living the dream here. That's cool. This is really unique for me in, in the fact that I usually I get to talk to high school coaches most of the time, some college coaches, or guys that are, are in, a, in another space, maybe just in the leadership of, uh, area, uh, or they just do podcasts. But you, you've kind of done um, all, all of it. You, you, are, you, you have been a coach, a college coach, but then you also get to talk to so many, uh, so many great leaders and coaches. So this is just so unique for me, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been amazing. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, you go into some of these things with the intent or the vision of some of these things happening. But, uh, you know, until you're actually doing them, it's it's sometimes surprising. So I'm always happy to talk basketball. I'm always happy to share and, uh, you know, been grateful for all the conversations I've had with high school coaches, youth coaches, you know, and obviously college, Europe, pro, wherever. It's just yeah. been a lot of fun to be able to talk basketball. So when I ask you about one, what's one thing that makes your program different, you know, the cool thing is, is you can really draw from uh, a, a few different places. You can draw from when, when you were coaching or, or, or your, your teams that you've had. You can also draw from, you know, the basketball immersion uh, uh, program that you run, but then also maybe from uh, some great leaders that you've talked to. So what does make, what, what does make a program different? Well, as you said, I mean, from, I mean, the basketball podcast in particular, having, you know, 200 plus conversations with coaches from different levels and around the world. I mean, like, think about that just every day. And I, I frame it for you as this, as if I had a team, it'd be really hard to do that because it's almost too many ideas and too many things that make you think and too many things that make you go, is there a better way? Yeah. So for me, it's more, you know, an accumulation of all this knowledge without having to direct it specifically to one team. So I think that helps me refine it in a way that, say, a coach that's in the moment, especially in the season, has a harder time doing. Because it's really hard to add or subtract during the season, and nor should you necessarily do that a ton. You know, you got to go with what brought you there and what you believe in and your philosophy and some of those things. So for for me, what, what makes what I do unique now is just, again, the the diversity of information that comes my way and then the diversity of information that I then try and make practical for coaches. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's really what's made Basketball Immersion, and I, I'm assuming Basketball Podcast, a brand for people to go to because it's not just a, a, you know, a content dump. It's, it's, it's content that has purpose. It's content that is aligned with evidence-based ideas. And it's certainly content that is practical and applicable for a coach because, uh, you know, again, I wanted to create a one-stop shopping area for coaches because I know how hard it is. <laughs> you know, Matt, you and I are any other coach at coaches. I mean, there's almost, I don't know if I was a young person nowadays. I always say this to Alex Ram and Webster Basketball Immersion. I don't know if I was a young person nowadays, if I could function. There's just too much information, too many things that you can access you know, online that it's like, wow, like I, my mind would blow up probably. So I think I'm grateful for this point, having gone through the process of coaching and now being able to amalgamate that information for others. That's such a great point. Like, and, and so what do we do coach? Because I've actually had a, a coach contact me, a friend of mine that started going through, I'm, I'm way early. You, you mentioned you're, you're 200 plus. I'm, 
<laughs> I'm just in the forties right now and, and really learning on the fly. I'm, I'm just a high school coach learning how to do this and enjoying talking hoops with others. But he, he said, he said, Matt, there's just so many good things that people are doing. How do I, how do I do it all? Like, how do I add, what do I know what to do? You know, what's kind of your advice for a guy that, you know, goes through the list of guests that you've had and all the, the materials that you have. And it's just, feeling overwhelmed with what's out there? Well, I think it all connects back to your core, you know, and I think coaches like no matter, you know, probably with the exception of maybe just a brand new coach, most coaches have a core of things where principles of offense or it's, you know, concepts on defense or it's their core values and those things. And, and by and large, certainly we can shift those things. Certainly we can add or subtract to those things. But by and large, I'd say that's our consistent structure. And I'll give you an analogy that's similar to teaching offense is that I believe, even though I believe in freedom and creativity for players, I do believe that that starts from structure. So let's say I'm teaching them a structure, a, a spacing template, say like the two side fast break. I'm going to teach them the template, but then gradually what's going to happen is we're going to move from that structure to less structure. So structured to unstructured. And that's a huge goal of that process that we go through on offense. And then with that, when I connect that back to what you asked, for me, it's like, okay, I have this core, these core values or these principles of play, and I believe in those, and that's my structure. But from there, when I learn all these things, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to get a little less structured and unstructured at times as I collect this information. And then what I'll do with that information is gradually I'll add and subtract. And, uh, you know, I mean, you and I, we're, we're old enough to know lists. And it's like, you know, you start with a big list and then you gradually subtract and then you gradually subtract and then it gets down to the most important things. And that's really the process that I go through basically every day that I learn mm. and only add the most important things. And it could be something like a new idea or it could be something in terms of how you or another coach phrases things. And I would say that's the superpower that I've been blessed with is that ability to be able to hear phrasing and say, OK, that's just better than how I say it. <laughs> like and that. now I'll adapt that and I'll adapt that. But you do have to know, you do have to know, like you mentioned, your core and what, what style of play or what type of uh, and, and style of play that works for the players that you have, but also that you believe in that gets you excited, that, that, that joy that you have from teaching freedom and creativity with your team, your players just feed off of that. And I've just seen in myself, like I, I listen to coaches, I go to clinics and, and what they're doing just makes so much sense and it looks so good. But then I've got to be careful not to try to add too much in because simplicity is where a lot of this, where we're talking about creativity and where it, where it lives, in my opinion. Well, and that's absolutely true. And uh, I give, you know, it, it, wisdom simplifies, but is preceded by messiness and struggle is really how I would say it. Like this, this wisdom that we ultimately get to as a coach or as a player or as a person, it, it's, you know, the goal is that it's simple because wisdom really in the end is what that means is it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> it means something to us and, it, and it's very purposeful and all those different things that come with it. But that's always preceded by messiness and struggle. And I think coaches sometimes, I think one of the struggles they get into is they try and skip those steps. But the messiness and the struggle and the confusion, that's all part of the process. And I think about all the way back to my school days, the projects that gave me the most trouble were the ones that left me with the most learning or the most meaning because I had to struggle and I had to fight for my learning. And that's something that, again, I encourage coaches to consider when it comes to their players. We don't want to cheat them out of those opportunities because sometimes we can structure them so much, not just with, say, an offensive structure, but also with our words and our teaching and our lessons. Like you and I, we're really good. Like we can give coaching clinics to our players. But we cheat them out of their opportunities for the messiness and struggle, which leads to permanence and leads to their solution instead of our solution. So, you know, as a simple thing, I mean, I just encourage if you teach an offense, once your players know the offense, just encourage them to go off script. And that could be a segment of practice. That could be a day of practice. But gradually just encourage them to go off script. Because that's as simple as it gets from going from structure to unstructure, and that's going to make your offense better. Now, again, it's a buffet. Not every player 
can go off script or, you know, because that's a high school situation. You right? know, you little three. Timmy, little Timmy tried a few things. <laughs> yeah, like you got two or three players that are coming off another season, basketball. Yeah. They're just good athletes to play basketball. Yeah, they don't get the same. They don't get deep the same at the buffet as the players that are basketball players. Mm. And, and that's a part of it, too. And that's sometimes misconstrued about what we're talking about in terms of freedom and creativity. Not every player earns that because not every player is a full time basketball player, especially when we're talking at the youth levels. I think that's a great reminder, even for coaches that maybe they're they're not as much they're not teaching uh, more of a conceptual offense, but they're it's more of they have a list of plays that they love and that's their go tos. But I used to direct for PGC, and one thing we would always tell our our players is, uh, even though you're running plays, don't turn your brain off. Continue to look and hunt for opportunities or advantages. I think that's a reminder for us coaches, even like even if you don't want to go the the route that I feel like you've gone and I know I have a uh, we we teach a, a structure, but within that guys, there's just possibilities and it's a canvas that you can really find your way on. And and to me that's the most fun. But to encourage your players within the plays that we're running, be have the freedom to break it off and to see an advantage and to go for it. What are your thoughts on, on that? Basketball decisions supersede basketball plays. Basketball decisions supersede basketball plays. That's a simple phrasing that I've come up with recently that I think just, again, nails that for me and nails it for players to be able to understand that at the end of the day, a decision will, will that we want decisions. We want decisions that lead to advantage. Now, your principal plays, say if we're talking about offense, but same thing on defense. I want decisions on defense. And I find we're too structured sometimes on defense as well. Mm. Um, so freedom on both ends comes from that structure. But then once they got that structure, creating this unstructure really leads to, you know, this ability to be able to say your decision supersedes the structure. And uh, let's give an example on offense. Okay, you catch the ball. You have an advantage, say it's a shoulder to chest advantage on a defender, even though you're supposed to make that next pass to run the play, you see space and you can phrase it however you want. But we would say if you see space because you have this shoulder to chest advantage, attack it, right? We want to yeah. create that advantage. We created the advantage. Now we have the advantage, take advantage of advantage, and then everyone plays off of that. And that's where I think, you know, the play after the play, whether this is penetration reaction, post reaction, offensive rebounding reaction systems, those are almost more important than the actual initial play. And that's a big part of what we're trying to share in terms of what you said, trying to bring that home for coaches. I've, I've, all, I've heard of so much and I've thought about too much structure on offense, but you said something a second ago. I've really, I don't think I've ever thought about too much structure on defense. Can you can explain that a little bit more? Like where do you see that and in what situations? Well, so many situations. I mean, let's let's be honest. The defense, and this is an old uh, Chuck Dalyism, I think, originally, but the defense doesn't break down in the help. It breaks down in the recovery. Well, recovery is messy. And the problem is, is if we can get really structured at the point of the ball, okay, we're one pass away in help. You know, you're in this perfect position. You're in this perfect position. And that's fine when it's just this shell scenario. But in a game situation, the offense creates an advantage. We have to take away that advantage. And most of that has to do with the offense tries to create space. We want to take away space. So that's where defensive decision-making comes in. And, you know, we teach – it's the same concept. Say we teach early in the year, we're trying to teach perfect rotations to our players. As we progress, we try and talk to them about there's no perfect rotation. Mm. It's the first person that talks is right, and the first person that gets it, get there – tells the next person what to do. And it's this kind of defensive decision-making that I, I believe has always made our defense a little bit stronger because, you know, instead of this perfect structure, you've got to just overcome, you know, the offensive advantage. And that's really a big set. So uh, advantage drills, like any type of advantage drills, four on three, for example, those teach defensive decision-making. I don't matter. Are you spending a ton of time in advantage drills telling your – like stopping the defense and telling them, hey, you screwed up. You should have done this. You know, there's no wrong. It's like you're screwed if you don't just compete. Yeah. You, know, you got to find a way. Figure it out. Figure it yeah. out. Don't give yeah, up. Keep moving. Adjust. Totally. totally. And that's what good defense is, to be honest. Yeah. Again, I mean, and that's from the NBA on down. You'll see coaches like they may not admit it because everyone wants to have like this perfect defense. And we always talk about pack line, this perfect defense. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> 
what happens if they get past the initial help? <laughs> yeah. Then it's in the recovery. And that's that's for all defense. So Shell always looks good when the offense isn't moving and they're only <laughs> moving the ball around the perimeter on a, after one one thousand. That's that's what Shell yeah. looks really good. Hey, hey Matt, I'm not anti Shell Joe, but I'm right. anti staying there. Yeah. And that's a problem. I think coaches stay in Shell too long. Like Shell is Shell is great for that initial, you know, structure. Terminology, that, you know, get yeah. your terminology out. Yeah. 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 But after that, I mean, it's like, you know, let's, let's go, let's play a little bit more like shell. Let's go one rotation. Now it's live or just create the scenario that you got to work on and work on it. You know, those type of things. But what you said about your on those advantage games, we are, we're all, I mean, two on ones, three on twos, four on threes. Like we, because of the offense we run, we live in those spaces quite a bit, but I've never thought about that. We are teaching defensive principles from that and and probably or not just teaching it our players are going through them and learning how to adjust how to see a need and fill a need Mm -hmm. instantly and so that that gave me a lot of freedom that you mentioned that because i i i love valuing time for these small-sided games but then in the back of my mind like well we still have all of these defensive checklists that i have to get done maybe i'm doing them in that time you're you're doing them more than you realize, especially yeah. again, like this two-way coaching, two-way teaching type of concept. And that's the one of the advantage that I say about playing more basketball in practice is that, and by basketball, I'm saying offense versus defense because basketball transfers to basketball. Like, I'm not sure if your, you know, on-air defensive drill, closeout drill transfers much to basketball beyond maybe, again, communicating your language or your needs. But what we know is playing basketball transfers to basketball. So this concept of two-way teaching, and even if you're focused on one area, say offense more than the defense, you're still getting meaningful reps. And you're most importantly, you're getting perceptual reps. Like your defenders are getting perception reps of what do I perceive? What do I decide based on what I perceive? And then what do I execute because of that? You know, and that's really important. And, uh, you know, that's why I can't encourage coaches enough to play more basketball. One, players enjoy it. And two, it does connect these things for you. Coach, are you saying that it's okay for our players to have fun in practice? That's okay? You know, and and we can define fun how we want to define (laughs) it, but... Like smiles are okay. And by the way, like when I'm coaching at camps, especially in the summer, like when I'm traveling around the world, like I have to tell kids it's okay to smile Mm. because they've been taught, you know, unintentionally, I believe most of the time that basketball or sport is really serious. serious. Yeah. 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 And it's like, we have to create this psychological safety for them to be themselves and to be able to have fun. And, And again, it's this balance between intensity and comfort. Right. Like, yeah, we want intensity. Yeah, we want you to play hard. But can't you do that and still enjoy yourself? Well, I think so. I think competition is fun. That's why most players are playing still basketball or a sport at the high school level is because they like competition. And then I'd say the second area that is fun is seeing themselves improve. And we just we just simply don't spend enough time on that as a coach about noticing when a player improves. And it could be from bad to okay. It could be from okay to good, from good to great. And we know those steps are a little harder as you get better. But just how much time a week do you spend noticing that your player couldn't do something as well last week and now can do something better this week? I I think that's where, personally, where sometimes practice plans can get in the way for me. If if, if I have these rigid times in this long checklist that I have to go through, I I will be fine. I find myself, this is a few years ago, I've, I've gotten away from it more. Uh, I found myself really not even focused too much on <laughs> what's on the floor, more of how's our time? Are we getting through this? Can, can we move on? Are we good? Can we go? And, and, and then I I can't imagine how many of those moments that you just talked about that I missed uh, being a slave to the plan or moving on for moving on sake. So here's what I would write on my practice plan. And maybe just this is my practice plan. is you're okay and you belong. So that would remind me every day to tell every player that you're okay and you belong in some context. And that my first interaction with a player on the day I'm going to coach them is not a coaching moment. It's something about, hey, those shoes are really cool or, you know, or something about, hey, how did the test go? Like it's something non-basketball because I want to value them as a person. And then obviously there would be something on there about noticing progress. 
Mm. And it would be those three things every day that I just want to do for every player is I want to notice progress and something they couldn't do, but they can do a little bit better. And it could be just a quick short burst and say, Hey, Matt, like you're so much more balanced on your closeouts, keeping the ball in front, you know, than you were last week. Boom, move on. But they now know that you value them. They belong. And also that you're noticing that their work is leading to improvement. And isn't it that that our, that's ultimately our goal beyond winning and losing, obviously, is developing people, but also that your players can connect. That's what we worked on. Like for me, if I spend all my time in practice connecting for a player, your hard work is leading to this. Then won't they value hard work and we don't have to talk about it anymore because mm. they know it leads to something. And too often we just say hard work and, you know, work hard. And well, what are we connecting that to? Yeah. And what if, what if in thinking that way too, we become uh, more fun to be around? You know, we, we have, we have, we enjoy practice more ourselves because with that shift in your focus, you're really looking for the positives that they're doing. But I could, because I think so many, I mean, especially early on when I was starting out, my eyes just were darting around and looking for negatives for mm -hmm. things that I have to hit right there. That's a big shift though, for a lot of people. It's definitely a big, big shift, but you know, it's, it's so doable. I mean, we can, yeah. we can all do it. And I think intuitively we all want to do it. And I think again, like coach coaches, I mean, there's there's been false narratives about coaches perpetuated for years and that's that intensity trumps everything right our intensity the players intensity that will solve all problems if we just work harder and we do things more and you know if you've read a lot of eastern philosophy or different things like that i mean it's a big difference between let it happen and make it happen and uh too often we consider let it happen giving up right but that's not it it's actually relaxing and uh, we try and frame it for players too and Truthfully, for me as a coach, I have the same struggles you just talked about. I still do mm. that. I'm too intense and I have to calm myself to be a teacher rather than a coach. And that's a big thing. But I tell players all the time, offenses plays played best at 70 percent. You know, it's not played best at 100 percent and 110 percent. I would never share that as a narrative. Like it just doesn't exist. You play better when you're relaxed. Wow. You play at 70 percent on offense. Maybe maybe it's 80, 90 percent on defense, you know, in terms of phrasing it. But for me as a coach, I'm a much better coach at 70% than I'm 100%. And uh, that's just a way of kind of framing it. I'm not sure if that's actually true in terms of those numbers. So nobody go question those numbers. Make up your own. But, but for me, sense. that helps me understand. It makes sense. It makes sense. You go 100% on defense, you're probably fouling. Totally. You, you go or you're making mistakes. Offense, you're over-pursuing. the ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, and and what are the moments I regret most as a coach from a year this past season? Probably the moments when I was going 100% on an official or 100% on one of my players, where my wife, who does our book, after the game goes, Matt, you're a, your face that one <laughs> time when you were looking at that kid. You know, those are those moments I wish I could, I could take back. So what a great nugget there, Coach. Thank you. Coaches, the Jamoti Podcast is sponsored by 3 on 3 Hoops Hub. 3 on 3 Hoops Hub has run over 350 3 on 3 basketball leagues for kids since 1997. 3 on 3 is the ideal format for players to get a lot of opportunities, work on all skills and positions, and have fun with their friends. Whether you want to build your program, raise some funds, or start your own business, you can bring 3 on 3 to your community and do it like an expert by learning from the best with 3 on 3 Hoops Hub's free 90-minute training. You can register at the link in the show notes. On your platform, I, I love that you, you mentioned you have so many uh, different types, styles of plays, and it's a one-stop shop. But if you could choose, you know, maybe your favorite style of play to teach, or when you do go to camps and these ideas that you're sharing, you know, what would that be? Well, for me, I mean, it starts from a principles of play. And I, I really do think this from a player development standpoint, a team development standpoint. I mean, it all starts from whatever your principles of play are. And, you know, I can choose any offense that fits into those principles of play because, the, as I said, the principles of play are basketball decisions. And those supersede anything else. So, for me, I could run Spain pick and roll or I could run, you know, Princeton or whatever it is. It does not matter the structure. What matters is these principles of play. And uh, for, for, for me, I mean, I'll just share a few of them, but uh, zero seconds. I mean, zero seconds means no pause on the catch, no predetermined decision mm -hmm. that you catch it and you're ready to make a play, um, you know, shoot it if you're open, uh, pass it if you're not, and then drive it if nobody's open. 
you know, that type of mentality is really simple, especially coaching my youth, uh, you know, my daughters who, you know, nine and 11 now and coaching how, their how team. Is that? Do you enjoy doing that? I, I love it. Cause again, Matt, like I've done camps for a long time, say yeah. at 12 plus and going back to that level where some of them literally have not played basketball before it, it, it again, it reminds me that if I go in with a predetermined understanding of what they need to learn versus I go in with an open mind and see what they need to learn. What a difference. Wow. I mean, I'm telling you, it opened my mind again. And I, even though I say those words, I believe those words, and I share them all the time, actually experiencing that at that level was just amazing. And it, it just shifted from pra- within a practice, from practice to practice, to just say, wait a minute, I need to work on this. And then the challenge for me is also to work on it within a game's approach, which is I'm trying to do offense versus defense almost all the time even for unskilled, can't dribble, can't shoot players. Mm. Because again, I'm trying to connect the decision for why they need to work on their skill and then inspire them to work on the player-led development on their own a little bit. Okay, how many of them go home and do their parents text me and say, hey, you know, Addison's working on her game, you know, in the driveway. You know, that to me is more of the win than anything that happens in practice. I I wonder, I I don't think probably the eight-year-olds don't, know or or truly appreciate the level of coach they have do the parents of that team understand who they have coaching (laughs) their talk because it's it's incredible i'm pretty sure it's different than what a majority of the youth experience is well it's great i'm sure i'm sure they have no idea (laughs) they have no idea because they're not in our space matt they're not in the space where you know and i could tell them hey look and i presented for nba coaches and they'll just like, okay, cool. But what are you doing for my daughter? That's right. You know, and that's the most important thing, to be honest. And I love that about parents. I mean, they, 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 you know, should value the experience for their daughter and in this example, or for their child. And that's a part of it. And then it's my job to help them understand a little bit more of the process. And that is always it, whether it's a camp or whether it's coaching, as I said, this age group, I try and educate the parents and I try and put them on the team as much as possible. Say a summer camp, I have 80 kids. The first thing I do is I meet with all the parents and I explain to them what they're going to see, why they're going to see it. And then I create psychological safety for them, hopefully, and saying, you are allowed to talk to me. If you have questions, you're welcome to ask them. I have a purpose and I have a reason behind everything I do. And I'm happy to share it with you. I mean, I'm thinking of our parent meetings at the beginning of the year. That, that most of us coaches have and 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 how it's normally just about the rules like what are what are the rules or the standards or 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 what your son are, can't do mm-hmm. uh, uh, this year but what a what a different mind shift there of bring I love that what you said bring them on the team mm-hmm. like I when I was at public school and I was younger and and, and hostile I, I had this idea that I was uh, on a different side of the road than, than the parents. And they're not allowed to cross that road to get over to me. And I'm not gonna cross to get over to them. Being at a private school has really helped me in that way of, they literally are paying to go to school mm. at there. So they have more of a right to it. But but even beyond that, it's much more of a, it's just much more of a great environment when they feel like there's that open door, open communication. But I, I love the the way that you talked about. I think a lot of coaches can take that last bit and, and really shape or reshape their parent meetings at the beginning of the years. Can I bring one other example? So Absolutely. when I was a college coach, I would always welcome my athletic director. He could come to any practice he wanted. He could come to any film session, any team session. He didn't, he's busy. He's not coming to everything. And he's very rarely coming. But when he came, I made it a point afterwards or sometimes during, or sometimes obviously a text or email later, just saying, Hey, what were your thoughts? You know, do you have any feedback? And I'll tell you, Matt, 99% of the time, I didn't, didn't care what he said. Cause I wasn't going to do it. Right. But I put him on our team. Like he felt like he had a voice. He felt like he was yeah. making an impact. And there were enough times where I could go back to him and say, hey, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, your comment about this, this and this. And whether I used it or not, he knows that I at least listened and I valued him and he felt more a part of the team. You know, but I think there's also, as we said with players, it's a buffet. Not every parent's the same. 
And not every parent gets to eat at the buffet the same way as other parents. And that's something that, uh, you know, we have to consider in terms of those things. And the difficult parents are usually the ones that just want to be communicated to more. Mm -hmm. And we've got to create that safety for them to be able to be communicated. Um, going way back, Michigan State Sport Youth Institute, you know, you would think they've done a number of surveys on this over the years, but the number one complaint parents have about coaches is not playing time, it's communication. And, and that does not surprise anybody, ultimately, if you really reflect on that. Because really, when we talk about playing time, too, that's more about communication. And uh, Matt, don't come and complain about your son or daughter's playing time unless you've come and sat in practice. And I really want parents to come to practice and watch. Okay, it. that's awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask you, like, what are your thoughts? I, 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 I watch, I mean, I'm in Texas where football is king. Yeah. And, and every football practice, there are dads lined up down there. And I don't know if the, the coach is asking them to come or they just, these, these dads just want to go. But there's this level of jealousy. They don't come to my practices. And I've told mm. them, guys, you're free to, I'd love for you to come to any of them. I think there's that's where a major disconnect is because and, and why maybe there's more investment at times into the select ball from parents like myself, my son's a freshman. I drive him to practice and I sit there and I watch and listen to everything that that's happening at practice, which then in a game, I feel like I'm more invested. Yeah, we just worked on that. Like, you know, but then our high school parents only come for 32 minutes. And, I, and they base everything off of what they see in that time. How do you encourage or, or get parents to come more? Well, number one, we're all in the off season right now, yep. more or less. So it's like, uh, for me, I'm never going to work on a player's shot without the parent being involved. Mm -hmm. Because if I think about who's going to rebound for that player, you know, so I want both parents to be at a session. Maybe it's only a 10 minute session where I go through, you know, match shot and explain to them what we're working on and explain to them how I'm rebounding. And also explain to them that rebounding is not coaching. Rebounding is shutting up and rebounding. And that's a big thing for my daughters too. Like, obviously I can coach every shot they shoot, but I tell them when we're in the backyard, I am just a rebounder. I am just a rebounder. That's my job. I'm just a rebounder because I want you to have a great experience experiencing the game and shooting and not getting coached on every rep. Now there's times where obviously, you know, they'll ask me, Hey, can you help me? I'm struggling with this. And that's cool. That's what that's I'm there for. That's a great for. place to be right there. That's yeah. a great place to be. And that's where I want to be with them, but that's where I want to be with my players too. And uh, that's where a parent should want to be with their child. Because I'll tell you again, the value of rebounding for your son or daughter is the conversations beyond basketball. I can't tell you, like sitting around the dinner table and asking, hey, how was your day versus rebounding? And then my daughter's starting to tell me something that happened during the day while I'm rebounding for her. Yeah. I mean, there's no better moment and there's no more, no more moment which brings more vulnerability, I feel, to the conversation than us experiencing a sport together and then us talking. And uh, it's just so, such great fun. So that would be one thing I would encourage. And the other thing I would encourage is I would make it, uh, you know, if they're not going to come, I would make one practice maybe at the beginning of the year you know, a parent practice where the parents actually get changed and they, you know, you go through the drills and go through the offense and no way. You know, yeah. Cause I've done that with coaches. I mean, Matt, if you're at one of my BI academies, you're coming on the floor and you're going to do BDT and you're going to do some of these things. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to create psychological safety for the parents and for you and say, Hey, there's no judgment. No one's recruiting you. No one's comparing you. No <laughs> one's, you know, no one's evaluating you. We're just here. I want you to experience this because I think sometimes Again, all of us, whether it's a coach or a parent, we don't have the perspective. We can come from a place from a place of sympathy, but it's much different coming from a place of empathy, of actually having experienced something. So you having done VDT, now you can understand a little bit more how your players make mistakes. Because yeah. you know what? It's it's not easy what we ask them to do a lot of times. I think that's the same for parents. And a parent coming to a practice and watching – just for me, it gives me a conversation that I can go to them at some point and I can say, hey, listen, you know, Matt's really improved at this, this, and this. Come to practice, notice it, but understand here it's what Matt still needs to improve to be able to play more because Joey can already do all those things. And it's that type of thing that it's not like we're saying, hey, Joey's better than Matt. Well, he's better at basketball than Matt because he's worked harder at basketball. But it's like Matt can get better. Matt can get better, but here's what it is. And just kind of pointing those things out, I think, help parents understand. Everything's about needs improvement anyways. Mm. And it's probably a, a higher level of accountability then 
on our part as coaches. If we are going to bring them in, I mean, uh, an example I thought of is when you ever invite a friend to your church, how when they come in, you start to notice every little detail more because you're trying to think like, is this per like, what are they seeing? What are they? I think when you invite those parents and, and I don't know if that, if that example works, but I may be thinking more and more about the details of how we run things, how I'm communicating, you know, how I'm teaching because of, of the people in the room. I attended a Stan Van Gundy practice when he coached the Detroit Pistons and he gives coaches a sheet of feedback that he wants them to fill out a feedback form afterwards. They're, they can be anonymous or they can not be. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't matter. But I would do that for parents too. Like, and again, whether you read it or not, you put make them feel like they're having a voice and having a, a participatory vo voice. But again, what do you do for the parent that's too much? That's really the challenge. I think you'll... The, the parents said not involved at all is a huge concern because we want, like, I, I think that should be a concern too. How can we bring that parent more involved in their son or daughter's experience in basketball? But the parent that's over-involved is a problem for sure. So how do we curtail that a little bit? Then, you know, one, it's an honest conversation, just like you'd have a player. You want truth or harmony? Mm -hmm. uh, Josh Merkel just said that on the podcast this week. Do you want truth or harmony? And I would start that. And now I'm stealing that or adopting, adapting that line. And I'm going to use that and say, hey, listen, you know, to a parent, I, I can tell you the truth or I can tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. You know, which one do you want, basically, is what we're saying. Everybody then, will say truth. Everyone says truth. But they really want harmony. They yeah. want <laughs> harmony. But now you can hold them to that. Right, right. Right. It's like it's like the difficult to coach player. Okay, are they difficult to coach or are they difficult to coach because you as a coach aren't willing to change to coach them in a certain way? So to me, the first thing I do with a difficult to coach player is I'll ask them, hey, do I have permission to coach you? Yes or no? And of course, they'll say yes. And now to a certain extent, I've got them and I'll keep referring back to that and say, listen, wait a minute. I thought I had a, we had an agreement. I can coach you. Is that is that agreement not in place anymore? Because if it's not in place, that's cool. I just want to know up front. Because, I mean, 80 kids at a summer camp that I do, uh, maybe there's – I'd say generally we have no behavior problems because we keep them on task. But yeah. say we do have one player that really just doesn't want to be there and doesn't want to participate, blah, blah, blah. To me, I'll go to them. I'll interact with them in a similar way. Can I coach you? I'll go back to them again. I'll remind them. I'll go back to them again. I'll remind them. So I really am putting effort into trying to bring them on the team. But then at some point, I will just say, that's cool. But just understand, I'm not going to coach you. And, th and if that's what you want, that's cool for me too. And it sucks. Like, it really does suck in that, in that scenario. But what is my responsibility? My responsibility ultimately is to the players that want to be there and to the best players. And that's really what my responsibility is. Because if I spend so much time on the worst player – or on the player that doesn't want to be there, I'm taking time away from the best players. And that somewhat is the case for parents as well. If you want to draw that analogy to them That's is, uh, you know, we just, we just got, <laughs> we got to manage some, but we can put so many on our team that it, it overcomes that one we have to manage. And when you, when you have that discussion with the player, you've got to, <laughs> you've got to mean it. Like, cause I think, I think that the idea of it sounds great to coaches, you want truth or harmony. Well, if they, choose or they walk away from the truth that you're giving then you you have or when you say listen i want you to tell me do you want me to coach you or not i mean it, it, and you have to as a player you have the right to say well no coach i don't want to be held to that standard that if they do answer that way i mean i've i've had that happen then you have to show them that you mean <laughs> what you said yeah because right. don't don't you can't put in a rule if you're not going to enforce it yeah yeah. Same thing in this. You can't create an expectation if you're not going to enforce it. And and then they have to know the consequence. And I would also outline that, and you can determine that for yourself. But the consequence of me not coaching you is you're not going to get better. You're not going to improve. And people are going to get better than you, and people are going to play more than you. I'm not going to go right to a threat and say, okay, you're not going to play then. Damn. No, here's the reason you're not going to play. You're not going to play as much as you want to play because you're not going to improve because you're not letting me coach you. Because there's a direct correlation between those two things so connect that as a way so it's not a threat it's just literally you're not going to get better or as good as you could get <laughs> coaches the Jamodi podcast is powered by biology 
What's your BSA score? The Vology Skill Assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the NIA and NJCAA to discover and develop the best talent for your team. This 10 minute, 100 shot test can be taken for free today on the Bology mobile app. Elevate your game. Yeah. Oh. Coach, somehow we went from style of play I know. into all of that good stuff that we just talked about. Okay. Do you want me to go back to style of play? <laughs> yeah, let's go back. Let's go back there because I'm, I'm fascinated uh, to hear what you what you love to teach. Well, I mean, uh, style of play, I mean, zero seconds, as we talked about before. Um, you know, dominoes is the concept. I mean, Alex Sarama has done a great job sharing that. But this concept of once you have advantage, keep the advantage. So once we have the defense in recovery, we are not in a play anymore. We're just constantly in, again, attacking closeouts, drive and kick, or keep the ball moving. That could be ball reversals, different things like that, that obviously keep the advantage. So this dominoes type effect that's obviously so, so important and prevalent in today's game is creating that advantage and then going from there. Uh, floor is lava is another conceptual offensive concept, which is that, uh, you know, if you, if you drive or you cut into space, then you get out of space. Oh, so okay. clear the paint, for example, after a kick out. So we don't want players to hang out. And again, that's, that's our concept. I know other coaches that want them to post after a drive or different things like that. But, uh, and then another principal play is just, again, everything's spacing. Like if, if you ask my, uh, 10 year olds, a question on offense and they don't know the answer because they don't know most of the answers at that age. They know enough to just say space. <laughs> and that's what I tell them. I say, listen, every offensive question, the answer is, or the answer is the same spacing. And now if you, if you came here, Matt today and you ask any one of them, you know, if you do this and you do this on offense and this and this and this, what's the answer? They'll say spacing. Because they don't know the answer, but they know spacing matters. So spacing super, is obviously everything. So see the space, attack the space type of mentality in terms of those things. So just, you know, those are some basic principles of play. But that guides how I teach offense and our player development stuff, too. It's how I teach offense uh, to 80 campers from different programs. Mm. You know, it's like we're going to adhere to these concepts uh, because that's what's going to help you get better at basketball. And to be honest, you'll be able to go back to whatever system you play in and be better at basketball because we adhere to these principles of offense. That, you nailed it. Yeah, that's what I was going to follow up with. It. They're probably going to go back and truly be able to take the skills they're learning with you and plug them in with the exception of small things like when I, when I, if a coach wants them to truly basket cut or, or sit in the post, you know, get their head under the rim or sit in the post, right? But the concepts that you're you're teaching them they can go home and, and really on their own plug in and and their coach hopefully will notice like an increase in iq or an increase in their ability to see things and make things happen well i i hope so i mean that's ultimately the goal i mean for me uh you know obviously you know <laughs> i try and tell kids all the time look and look your coach may tell you to do something completely different than me but just understand my goal in player development and my goal in a camp setting, for example, is for you to have selfish time. That means I'm only focused on your individual development. It's your coach's job to figure out how you best fit into the team system. I'm not approaching it from that perspective. I'm only approaching it from selfishly, how can you get better? And those are two different things. Now, if I'm coaching my team, there's no separation between player and team development because we're all building the same skills and decision towards the same principles of play. But if I'm coaching your players, Matt, in the summer, then I selfishly want them to get better, but I want them to feel like they should selfishly want to get better. So they go back and now Matt has more possibilities about ways to use them, whether it's on offense or defense. But truly, most of it comes back to offensive development. If you're talking back to fun, I mean, players can say they love defense and some truly do. But mostly we love defense because it helps our team win. Yeah. You know what? Players do not love defense coaches. Don't pretend that they do. They want to improve on offense because it's a lot of fun to shoot. It's a lot of fun to score. And there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean defense isn't important. When they walk into the gym they don't, and there's a ball on the floor, they don't instantly go into slides. They grab the ball and they just try to jack it from wherever they're at. Like that, that, you're right on yeah. the money. That's a great analogy because, Matt, I mean, when you go play pickup with all the, the old uh, old people, you know, like me, I mean, we're not doing shell drill to start. No. Nope. And nope. we're not doing three-man. And I can't wait to get – personally, I can't wait to get past the defensive end so I can get the ball back nope. and have fun again because at this age, 
I don't, I don't enjoy any part of that <laughs> anymore. So I'll connect defense to play for players as saying, Hey, this, this helps our team win. This is so important to help our team win mm-hmm. and us to experience success. And I mean, all the college coaches and all the stuff on Twitter, you know, all these lists and stuff that say, Oh, you know, be a hard worker, you know, be a great defender, be a great person. Hey, all that's true. I'm not discounting that, but I'm telling you every evaluation starts from offense. Mm-hmm. There's not a college coach in the world that doesn't look first at offense and then effort from there. Coach, that it goes right into one of my, I, I don't like the, I personally don't like the be a starter role mm-hmm. argument because the way I understand it, what what's trying to be communicated, which is on our team, I really need you to rebound and block out. Like I need you to do that really well because there might be people that, like you said, at the buffet, they're taking more shots and, and we need them to. But I just hear that too often. They use uh, Dennis Rodman or Patrick Beverly as examples. Like, listen, look at guys. Here are guys being stars at their roles. And in my, I kind of cringe because I think, first of all, they're millionaires. They're envy. If you tell me I'll pay you 100000 to sit at the end of the bench, you're never going to play. I would be a star at that right now. I would do that in a heartbeat. But then if they go back and they watch, watch the last dance, and watch Rodman in college. That dude scored. He averaged yeah. like 20 a game. Patrick Beverly was a bucket in college. So to tell a high school kid, just be a star to roll. That's what colleges want, what NBA pl- players do. Like, no, like if they're going to get any notice at all, it's going to be for what they can do with the ball in their hands. So my, my advice, and you can tell me if I'm kind of wrong in this, and maybe my whole thinking here is, Yes, be a star to roll, get to do whatever you can to get on the floor in high school, but work like heck on your own to develop your shot, your handle, your decision making. Yeah, maybe we should add a but to that. Be a star in your role, but don't be satisfied with your role. Yes, yes. Right? Like to me, that's that's absolutely true. I don't want a player to be satisfied with their role. Like I want them to work beyond their role you know, and not be satisfied. Now that does not apply for coaches. Like that doesn't apply to the non-basketball players. Like the non-basketball players, the football first that don't play basketball at all, except in your season. I mean, that's different. I mean, they truly just want to be a part of the team and we've got to connect that for them. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're helping us win because you're competing, you're rebounding, you're doing all these things, you know, but, you know, for basketball players, we want them to to value the fact that all that effort they're putting in the off season is leading to them having more possibilities. And uh, there's nothing wrong with saying that for sure. And I couldn't agree with your analogy more in that way. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. Uh, Yeah. Well, we share a lot of false narratives with players. mm. Like I do think, I mean, Twitter is the best thing for basketball in the history of basketball coaching. There's no question, but a lot of these lists that get thousands of likes and stuff like that. I mean, are just like, okay, work hard. Well, Really? Like no, that, no that's something we like, need to yeah. acknowledge. Like, of course you have to work hard. There's breathe there's air. Nothing in life. Breathe yeah. air. Yeah, yeah, breathe air. Yeah, breathe. <laughs> okay, that's cool. All right. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and obviously the other part is these generational debates, like players are soft nowadays and different things like that. I mean, that's just complete crap. I mean, well, let's just say we're all smarter. Like we're all smarter. And there's been I hope so. I mean, otherwise, Matt and I would still be using Blackberries instead of iPhones, right? Or, you know, Google Pixels. I mean, we're all smarter. Things things improve. And you know what's improved? Basketball coaching. You know what's really improved? Basketball playing. I mean, the stuff players are doing nowadays, oh, my coach would never have let Incredible. me do that. Yeah, yeah they wouldn't, my coach wouldn't have let me. Well, because your coach never saw that. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. never saw that that you could do it that well because, you know, again, we were really pigeonholed. And now because players have taken us to this next level. And by the way, players have taken us to this next level, not trainers, not coaches. Players adapt and they have improved so much because they have just put more time and effort into developing their skills in these really unique ways. And, uh, you know, all credit to players that have made us all better. Here, here's an idea. Uh, coach a style of play that you would have wanted to play in high school because uh, the player I was, uh, and I love my high school coach, and Tommy Thomas, if you listen to this, this is not me bashing you in any way, but you met, you nailed it. It just wasn't even like space and pace wasn't really even a thing. We'd play no. fast, but we were all in each other's way. There were single gaps everywhere and, and, and or the same kind of action and flow. But what was most fun was being creative. 
and, and, and having a few options. So maybe that there's an idea there is we need to coach now styles that as players, we would have really appreciated and loved to play. Well, I love that, and especially, again, to high school coaches that are still reluctant for the shot clock. I mean, everyone's, like, fascinated with Europe and how they develop players. But I'll tell you, it's not the coaching. Now, there are great coaches there. There are bad coaches there, just like there are here. But you know what it is? At a really young age, they get more repetitions mm. of offense and defense because there's a shot clock. Yeah, they're so forced take, to play. They're forced, they're forced, to, forced play. to play basketball as opposed to the coach taking repetitions away from players by running too much offense. And that that's it. That's the argument. There's nothing else. If Basketball in America is always going to be incredible. Like you're not getting passed. You have so many players playing. There's so many players that rise above bad coaching. And there's so many great coaches that help players get to levels. But at the end of the day, why do it? Because the, the experience for the player is better. And that's exactly to your point. What style would you want to play? Would you want to play a game? where you paid money as a fan, or if you were a player, you worked your butt off all week running suicides, then you came to the game and you held the ball. Held it. <laughs> are you kidding me? And now that coach is like, people are celebrating him as a genius. I mean, come on. You're taking athlete satisfaction and enjoyment out of the experience for them. And that to me is worse than just about anything that we could think about. Man. Like if I walk out of practice and I felt like, and I, definitely times I've done that, I've taken enjoyment out of practice for a player through my actions. There's no time that I feel worse about myself, not even a loss. I feel worse about myself in those moments where I did something to take enjoyment away from a player. And uh, every practice, that should be a reflection for coaches. We we can't allow for players to steal our joy of the game, even when they're acting like teenagers or or, uh -huh. or, or young men. But the, the opposite of that is true as well. We can't be I, – I just we, – we, I don't want to have a practice or, or be a part of a program Maybe maybe this is more like my college experience of how is he today? What kind of mood is he in today? Where players are coming in not knowing what they're about to experience. I think, yeah, we, we can be better. Well, we can be better. And again, like I, how many times, and, and you know this, you know this. I, I experienced this today a little bit where my voice was a little frustrated towards my daughter and just her going into kind of self-pity mode. And normally we would talk through it. And today I kind of, okay, I was a little sharper with it. And I know why, because it was something else bothering me. Yeah. And how often in practice do we take stuff out on players that had nothing to do with the players? And it's like, we've got to get in these Zen, mindful, present states when we go to practice and leave everything else behind. But that's exactly it. What kind, what kind, type of day did you have and what are you bringing into practice? And we're humans. Yeah. So I'm not knocking. We're humans as coaches. And we, but we do, I, yeah. yeah. We gotta, the we more gotta, we acknowledge we're human too, I think the more we can get beyond it. And we try and the narrative for coaches is we've got to be superhuman. Mm -hmm. Like we're above everything else that happens. No, I never humans. have bad days. Never. So. <laughs> no, no, we have good days. We have bad days. And uh, you know what? We make mistakes. Yeah. And I think, again, normalizing that for coaches is, is really a part of my journey as well to just say, yeah, look, I made, I'm, I've made a ton of mistakes. I've never been perfect. <laughs> mm. I never will be. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. We've been able to go through so many amazing things. Before I let you go, uh, I, I want to take you through the speed round if you're okay with that. This is where so many people get to listen to your basketball philosophy, basketball philosophy, but they may not really know who you are. So after the speed round, we will. Okay. All right. Favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> uh, Neapolitan, because oh. you get all three. Nice. That's good. <laughs> All right. I already know that I'm, I'm not even for high school shot clock or no shot clock. I ask it all the time. I'm fascinated, but I already know your answer. Who says no? I mean, I, it's, I've had a no. couple. And, and the only, only answer that I agree, I totally agree with you. The only answer that I thought, oh, okay. It is, uh, in, especially in high school, a superior team playing against an inferior team that, Maybe managing the clock a little bit, whole shortening possessions could uh, yeah. give them an advantage or, or, or at least a chance to. Because we both know the more possessions 
more possessions favors the more talented team. And and that's what – Can I counter that? Yes, please. So, 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 so the main thing is, like, when I coached a bad team and we held the ball, we were forced to take bad shots. Mm. When I coached a bad team and I finally realized, wait a minute, let's shoot the first open shot, we got better. Okay. And we went from not having won a game for about 15 straight games in my first college game to winning three of our last four and beating a ranked team because we simply – went to a place of saying we're really bad so we're trying to work for the best available shot it's not going to work out so we're going to shoot the best available shot um and then the other part that that whole statement's so anti-american so if that's an american coach like what like we can't say both things right like in america it's like this uh, this convenience of contradiction no shot clock is anti-american it is that. totally like we're worried about the team that's going to get blown out come you're on right you're right like, get better Yes. Get better. Like, that's so anti-American in so many ways. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Favorite holiday? Oh, definitely Christmas. I mean, it's the, the longest period that you get with your family in this extended time. And uh, just, just again, marvelous memories as a child and great memories now with my two daughters. Mm. Uh, texting or talking? <laughs> oh my gosh probably both in some ways but texting man i love texting because it just simplifies and it's, it comes back to that wisdom is simple simplifies i mean if you ask me phone or texting definitely texting you know because the phone i'm not i'm not an anti so i don't want coach to say i'm not i'm anti-social but it's just literally the fact that we can get right to wisdom love it invisibility or super strength Ah, uh, visibility for sure. I mean, just, you know, I mean, I'm a perception action coupling guy. So, you know, being able to, uh, to see and uh, see yeah. more is just like a marvel. And that would make me so much smarter. If you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? Oh my gosh. What a, what a great question that might be. I mean, I am so grateful. I mean, I can't tell you how many times my daughter loves history, how many times we talk about it, how much gratitude we have for living in this moment in this time. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just like, and I think if more people just reflect on gratitude, I mean, there, there's no better time than now, because again, we just keep evolving as a society and keep adding new technology or new things or new understandings or new learning. Think about like, I mean, just even 50 years ago, how little we knew about the world in some ways. Yeah. So, you know, to me, the only thing might be going back to say my youth. So let's say I go back to 10 and then I get to experience kind of that youth high school development years. Again, because I know people talk about some of those being the worst years of your life. But to me, it's like, wow, what an experience, yeah. like having so much in front of you and already being able to walk and talk and think and learn and all those things and retaining those memories. Two more. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Uh, usually it's two. Um, one, one kind of right when I wake up and then one a little bit later. And I try and do a lot of intermittent fasting. So nice. it's like coffee is the only thing in the morning. And I mean, yeah, as you so get older, you just black then, right? Yeah, only black, yeah. Only, only black. I've yeah. only ever been. Now, sometimes there'll be like a Starbucks if we're on the road or something, yeah, something yeah. different. But, you know, I mean, you just again, as you get older, you have to find ways to be able to change, change your habits so you can feel better. And, and I always like feeling good. Yeah. Last one, probably the most important coach out of anything we've <laughs> talked about today, Godfather or Star Wars. <laughs> or you I can say neither. Star yeah, I grew up with Star Wars, so definitely, you know, and, and there's um, jo Joseph Campbell is a great author, if, if people don't know about him, but he wrote about the power of myth and the hero's journey, and that's always connected back to me, too, that uh, yeah, if you want to go kind of check into those things, but uh, uh, just so many great things from that and learning about that and learning about mythology and uh, how it connects back. So Star Wars became more meaningful when I became more educated and learned mm -hmm. some of those things as well, but definitely Star Wars. Coach, this this has been. I mean, I, I get to. I've had the pleasure of talking to so many guys, and, and but this has been incredible. I think my notebook is going to be so full after I go back through and listen to this. Uh, if coaches want to connect with you or follow you, they need to check out the podcast. Go to Basketball Immersion. Kind of tell us a, a few ways they can do that. Well, basketballmersion.com, I mean, it's one-stop shopping for learning, uh, you know, a methodology around uh, how to connect skills and decisions and small-sided games and games approach. And, you know, we have course-based learning. We have videos. We have over 600 videos. We have master classes with experts around the world. So definitely, I'd love to have anyone that wants to uh, stimulate their thinking and uh, 
find out if there's a better way and a way to be able to add or subtract to their coaching to come there and become a member of our community. Uh, but all the basketball podcasts are there. All of our blogs that hopefully stimulate your thinking are there as well. And for me, I mean, definitely, if you want to connect with me, my DMs are open at B-Ball Immersion on Twitter. And, you know, Twitter's where us basketball people hang out. So I'm just, uh, again, so thankful for so many people that uh, have found value in what we've shared. And then so many people that have reached out and connected and asked really stimulating questions to be able to continue my learning journey. So, Matt, big thanks for you for so, some of those great questions and conversations as well. Uh, Coach, this was my pleasure. And, and man, thank you so much for just giving up your time today. It was incredible. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti Podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.